This lecture is over chapter 8. It's part 1. There will be two lectures over chapter 8, and this lecture will include material from sections 8.1 through 8.3. We'll be talking about neurons and action potentials, and it corresponds with your chapter 8 study guide part 1. So you can refer to that for uh, vocabulary, learning objectives, and the questions that you'll be turning in. So a neuron cell um, is the smallest unit of our nervous system. So we, we call it a functional unit because if you break the nervous system down into the smallest unit that can function on its own, you would have a neuron or a nerve cell. And we can classify nerve cells by their function. So we have sensory neurons, which would be neurons that um, are sending signals to the brain. So we would refer to those as, say, afferent. Um, we have interneurons, and we would have efferent neurons that are sending signals from uh, the central nervous system to our muscles or uh, target tissues. So if we look at the parts of the neuron, the main body of the cell we refer to as the soma. Okay, then we have these appendages that come out from the soma called dendrites. These are what receive the information or the electrical signal. The axon is then the area in which we transmit an action potential. The axon starts right here. This is the site of propagation of an a of an of a action potential. We call this the axon hillock. Okay, these were our dendrites. And we travel along the axon to what we call our axon terminals. Uh, where we will synapse with another neuron. Uh, these areas that we see right here, these are accessory cells. Um, right, they, they form the myelin sheath. And in between these regions, so these little areas that are not myelinated, we call these the nodes of Ranvier. Okay, that's the basic anatomy. Um, obviously, we have a nucleus as well of a neuron cell. We do have accessory cells that support neurons. Um, they uh, are classified by where they're found. So we have uh, accessory cells found in the central nervous system. We also have accessory cells found in the the peripheral nervous system. Uh, the two cells found in the peripheral nervous system are what we call Schwann cells and satellite cells. So your Schwann cells are what form our myelin. Okay, The satellite cells, these are uh, support cells that provide um, structure for the neuron and their cell bodies. Inside the nervous system, so in the brain and the central nervous system, um, the cells that form Myelin are called oligodendrocytes. So Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system, oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system. And then the two other type of accessory cells we find in the central nervous system are uh, epidemal cells. And these ones really kind of create the barriers between um, the different regions of the brain. Um, they do have some st store some stem cells as well and then we have astrocytes and microglia so our astrocytes they uh, serve a bunch of different functions um, they store uh, potassium they store neurotransmitters um, they store chemicals that they secrete that can affect neurons called neurotropic factors uh, they help form our blood brain barrier between um, the in the brain and they produce um, compounds that we utilize for ATP in the neuron. Okay, our microglia, you can kind of think of these as the neural immune cells. These guys go around 
and they act as scavengers and break down um, damaged tissue, uh, remove out wastes, um, and yeah, that's that's the function they serve. So those are our accessory, what we call glial cells. If we want to understand how our neurons communicate with one another, we have to understand electrical signaling and membrane potentials. So last week we talked about how we have different ion concentrations between the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid. And those ion concentrations uh, result in, in a higher concentration of sodium and chloride outside the cell versus inside the cell and a much higher concentration of potassium inside the cell versus outside. And because we have these electro or we have these ion concentration gradients, they form a, what we call an electrochemical differential. Okay, so we have a difference in charge between the two sides of our membrane. Um, and you can see those differences in charge, those ion equilibriums um, for each one of these uh, potential um, ions. So the a cell has a negative millivolt charge for potassium, a positive 60 millivolt charge for sodium, and a negative 63 millivolt charge for um, chloride. And we could calculate that out and find what our actual um, predicted membrane potential is, but for most cells, uh, what this equates to is that they has a what we call resting membrane potential of around negative 70 millivolts. So we can see that right here. We have this resting membrane potential around negative 70 millivolts and it can change um, depending on whether we have uh, ions moving into the cell or out of the cell. So if ions um, start to move into the cell, if we have sodium move in from the, inter from the extracellular fluid into the cell, we'll have what's called a depolarization of the cell. So our, our membrane potential will actually become uh, more positive, right? We'll start to um, become less negative, more positive, and uh, we approach what we call a uh, ion equilibrium. If we move away, so if we had chloride enter the cell or we had potassium leave the cell, we get what's called a hyperpolarization in which we move further away, become more negative. Uh, now one of the questions to illustrate this, the this difference in, in electrical change. If if a membrane potential changes from say let's say negative seventy all the way to positive seventy millivolts, have the ion gradients reversed? So if we go back to these ion gradients here, um, if this gives us negative seven millivolts and we go to positive seventy, does that mean that we basically flipped these? And the answer to that is no. We're actually talking about very small changes in concentration to get these types of change. Uh, the book describes it really well. It, it kind of talks about it like if you imagine um, grains of sand on the beach being what constitute our, um, our, our different ions inside the cell versus outside the cell. So you have sand both on the shore and in the water. And, and this is where it kind of breaks down a little bit, but we basically state that if, if we were to um, take just a you know a few grains of sand and you were to put those in your you get those into your eye and the irritation that occurs um, that's enough to create that you know this this change so it, it's not much we're talking about just maybe a, a couple ions of sodium moving in in order to create this large a differential now how do ions move into a cell? We talked about that last week too. We have gated channels. So gated channels control ion permeability, whether they can enter or leave a cell. Those channels can be classified into three groups. So mechanically gated, in which we need a mechanical stimulus to open that gate, something like pressure. We can have chemically gated uh, 
ion channels in which if we have a chemical bind to a binding site then it opens or we can have what are known as voltage gated in which changes in membrane potential will actually open or close um, the gated channel or voltage gated are primarily what we find in our neuron um, cells we do have chemically gated as well um, but voltage gated are what we find all along the axon and this is what what we use for cell signaling every gated channel has what we call a threshold this is the minimum stimulus required to open that gate so if it's a, a mechanically gated um, channel there's a, a threshold of pressure that's or stretch that's required before that gated channel opens um, voltage gated um, they can also vary from one channel type to another in which we can have um, a minimum threshold for activation or a minimal threshold for inactivation now our changes in membrane potential uh, we can measure those as changes in voltage like I said you know negative 70 millivolts maybe we get as positive as like 50 millivolts uh, but any change in a memory potential can be classified into two types of voltages what we call graded potentials and action potentials and these have some different characteristics that are important for us to understand let's start first with graded potentials now a graded potential is generally going to be found in the soma of the neuron okay it'll originate at a dendrite or on the cell body and it'll, those graded potentials will move towards the uh, axon. Okay, they're going to result, or they can either be a depolarization in which we're becoming more positive, or hyperpolarization where we're becoming more negative, and the size of this graded potential. So, how much of a difference in, in change in, in membrane potential is directly proportional to the strength of the stimulus. So the greater the stimulus, if I were to take a pin and jab it into my hand, right on um, a nociceptor neuron, right, right where that pin went, um, the harder I push that pin in, uh, the greater the change in membrane potential I will, I will get. And as I move further away from that point of where I stuck the pin in my, in my finger, I would expect that um, the strength of that greater potential is going to become less and less. So uh when a stimulus occurs um, and we and most neurons say this happens because uh, another neuron releases a neurotransmitter that binds at a chemically gated channel and allows an ion to move into that cell in this case we're seeing sodium move into this neuron and that as sodium moves in we create this membrane potential change it depolarizes the cell um, but as we get further and further away from that membrane depolarization, um, the potential loses strength. Why? Why do we lose strength in that potential? The answer to that is, is that as we uh, start traveling further and further distances from the site of initiation, um, that membrane has a resistance. So just like, say, a a, um, electrical cord that we put in um, the further it travels the more resistance there is in that cord we, we have a fluid medium so there's cytoplasm in here and just moving through that cytoplasm has some resistance additionally we have leakage that's occurring too so some of these ions that come in may also be leaking back out of the cell as we go further or, you know, over time and distance and so that's also going to lower the amplitude of the strength of that particular um, potential. Now as the graded potential moves closer and closer to the axon we reach an area known as a trigger zone um, or the axon hillock. This is the initial segment of the axon and this is the spot at which a graded potential can trigger what we call an action potential. Um, this is for all intents and purposes of a cell, this is its integrating center. If the membrane potential, when it hits this trigger zone, is above the threshold, 
um, needed to trigger an action potential, we will have an action potential. If it's below, we won't. And we call that decision point really the, uh, whether we have a sub-threshold graded potential or a supra-threshold. So let's look at these two. Let's say, okay, at the site of the stimulus, we initiated a depolarization. It's rather large, right? Um, let's say our trigger zone is negative 55 millivolts. Well, here we're above negative 55 millivolts. But as we move through the cell body, because of resistance and leakage, that slowly decreases. And by the time we hit the axon hillock, our graded potential is now below the threshold. So we're less than negative 55 millivolts. This would be a subgraded potential, and what happens is we do not get an action potential propagated. In the event of a super threshold graded potential, so now a much larger stimulus, um, we, as it travels, it doesn't decrease below the threshold. When we hit the axon hillock, it's still above the threshold, and so we now trigger an action potential that will occur and propagate down the axon. So we're sending a signal. So what's the definition of an action potential? And how is it different than a graded potential? So an action potential is defined as a change in membrane potential uh, that is con constant throughout the length of the axon. So how is this different than a graded potential? We talked about how graded potentials, we, we have an input signal but then it usually decreases right we have this loss because of resistance whereas an action potential is regenerative it it's maintains a constant membrane potential all along um, where does a graded potential usually occur well either in the dendrites or the cell body action potentials always occur at the axon hillock and then move through the axon what types of gates are involved well, depending on the neuron, we could have mechanically, chemically, or voltage gated. But in an action potential, the only types of gates we have are voltage gated channels. Uh, the ions involved, well, with a graded potential, it can be sodium, chloride, or calcium. With an action potential, it is only sodium and potassium in um, a somatic motor neuron. Okay, it can change a little bit. And some other ones, but for most parts, most X potentials are, are, are um, sodium and potassium. Now, the type of signal uh, it can be depolarizing or it can be a hyperpolarizing, so it could be the positive graded potential or negative graded potential. Uh, action potentials are always just depolarizing. And the strength of a signal and the graded potential we said it depends on the initial stimulus, it can also be um, summated. We'll talk about that next time. Um, but in an action potential, it's an all or nothing phenomenon. So if we trigger an action potential, it's going to have the same strength all along the length of the axon. Uh, it also can't be summated. Okay, what initiates it? Well, uh, graded potential is initiated as we have ions move through gated channels. Um, an action potential is initiated when we have an above threshold or a supra threshold graded potential and in, it opens ion channels in the axon hillock. Okay, other unique characteristics. Um, you don't have a minimum level required to initiate a graded potential. Okay, and signals can come really close together, they can summate on each other, um, and our stimulus strength is indicated by the frequency of the action potentials that we get, the initial one. Uh, in an action potential, uh, we have a threshold that's required to initiate. All right, If we're below that, we're not going to initiate. And we have something called a refractory period that limits two signals being too close together. So we don't have any summation in an action potential. And if we think of an action potential kind of like, it's almost like a domino effect because it's regenerative, right? So we hit the trigger zone and if we are, if we are above threshold, what happens is we start letting ions flow into the, this axon and we depolarize the membrane. And as we move down the axon, that continually happens over and over again. We have all these little ion channel gates that are found along here. And as long as this membrane 
is depolarized here, it depolarizes this one, and so it's like dominoes following in a line. That's how we always keep this constant level of depolarization. We call this, by the way, uh, saltatory conduction. The steps of an action potential are uh, important for you guys to know. So you should be able to basically draw me or label this figure and know what these steps are. So let's go through it. First, we're at resting membrane potential. So we're at roughly negative 70 millivolts. Okay, as we approach the axon hillock, right, if we have a graded potential that's above threshold, then what will happen is as soon as we are above threshold, we trigger the opening of sodium ion gates. Okay, so sodium starts entering the cell, which causes what we call the rising phase of an action potential in which we depolarize. Now these ion gates, I'm gonna just jump forward a slide, kind of show you. These ion channels, uh, they have two gates. They have what we call uh, activation gate, which is found right here, right? And they have an inactivation gate. So in their resting state, the activation gate is closed and the inactivation gate is opened. When we hit threshold, we trigger the opening of this activation gate and now sodium can move into the cell. Now at the exact same time that that's triggered, the inactivation gate is also triggered to close. But it is it's a little bit slower than the activation gate. So this opens really f quickly, this closes a little bit slower. So what happens is sodium starts rushing into the cell during the rising phase, but then again because this is timed, that um, inactivation gate closes and it stops sodium from rise, entering into the, into the cell. That gives us this peak right here, right? So the reason why we hit positive 30 uh, millivolts in, in this case is because now no more sodium is entering the cell. Now at this time we also have our potassium gates open. Question is when did the potassium gates get triggered? They, they open right about here. Are they triggered by this? No, everything is triggered by the um, reaching of threshold. So that means that our potassium gates must be much slower to open than the sodium gate activation channel and the sodium gate inactivation channel or, or your gate. So at this point now we have potassium and it's moving out of the cell. Okay, so it's moving from the inside, moving into the extracellular fluid, and that causes what we call a repolarization. So we become more negative. Once we um, get below resting membrane potential, uh, our, soda, or our potassium gates are then closed. So they close. So what we see is we actually have a, a period of what we call hyperpolarization. We overshoot. Okay, so this is the rising stage. This is the following, following stage. And then we have this, this um, period in which we need to repolarize and get back to resting membrane potential. And what triggers that is our sodium potassium ATPase pump. So we start, again, pumping uh, sodium out of the cell, potassium into the cell three sodium for every two potassium, and that gets us back to resting membrane potential. So those are the steps of an action potential. Okay, again, if we look at um, just ion permeability is a function of voltage. Again, we can see that our sodium enters much quicker and then stops during the following phase, whereas the, the potassium permeability lags. So these gates open a little bit slower. I already talked about the sodium channels um, and how both the activation and inactivation gates are triggered at the exact same time. Um, and we, we do have a positive feedback loop that's incur that occurs. So the more sodium that enters, right, um, we've gone even further past threshold. And so that triggers, you know, these gates, even, you know, neighboring cells around there, or sorry, not neighboring cells, neighboring channels around um, this channel to open as well. So we'll open up more of these, but what stops that negative feedback loop is ultimately 
the closing of the inactivation gate and then potassium leaving the cell. So here's this positive feedback loop again. We trigger depolarization. Sodium comes in. As sodium enters the cell, we further depolarize. So this is this positive feedback, right, that opens up more. Um, what stops this is the inactivation gate closing and then our slow potassium channels opening, leaving the cell, which allows us to repolarize. This brings us to this concept of a refractory period. So on this, this figure, uh, what we see here, here's our membrane potential, the permeability. You see in a bunch up here, we can see the ion gates of when they're opening. So once we hit threshold, both channels are closed, both the potassium and the sodium channel are closed we hit threshold and we trigger the opening of both of these, right? But our sodium opens first, we have sodium coming into the cell, then the inactivation gate gets, you know, finally closes all the way. Around that time we have potassium that's leaving the cell and that starts to um, have us repolarize. Uh, but what we see is all during this time our sodium gates are blocked by the inactivation gate, which means even if we have a depolarization, no um, additional sodium channels can open. So it's not until we get all the way back um, below resting membrane potential that we start to reset our sodium channel. Okay, so we're beginning to reset this, and by resetting the inactivation gate, so we're changing the conformation of this protein to where the inactivation gate is disassociating from this thing, which allows potentially sodium to move through. So during this period where all the gates are locked, you know, they've basically been opened and then they've been locked by the inactivation gate, we call this the absolute refractory period. During this period, if we had another graded potential come to the axon hillock, we would not be able to trigger an action potential. Once we start resetting these, um, we hit what's called the relative refractory period where we could initiate another action potential but we would need a greater than normal stimulus during this time. Why? Because one, we're further away from resting membrane potential so it's going to take more to hit our trigger, you know, our, our threshold. And then two, not all the gates are opened. Once all the channels um, have been reset right, I seem to say open, been reset to where the activation gate is reset and the inactivation gate has been moved away, um, then we no longer have a refractory period. Why is an absolute refractory period beneficial? Why, why have this? Well, it allows for one-way conduction of an action potential. So if we look at the axon, um, essentially we have a graded potential that occurs to where we kind of become um, more positive, right? And this then triggers an action potential to start moving down. And again, the domino is falling. So this area then triggers uh, uh, gates in this area to open and we start moving down the ion, uh, or down the axon. But because we have a relative refractory period, or sorry, an absolute refractory period, when we're here, we can't trigger these ion channels that are found on the axon here to open again. If we could, then what would happen is a signal would start to move down and then it could start moving this way, it could start moving this way, it'd bounce all around. We wouldn't be able to send a signal in a single direction. But because of that absolute refractory period, all signal conductance moves one way towards the axon terminals. See, so we keep moving. Now we're in, say, a relative refractory period. Um, and the relative refractory period means we need a larger signal than normal to do that. And because all action potentials have the same, that still prevents this region from, again, depolarizing. Now, this region over here could depolarize, but not in the relative refractory period by the actual action potential itself. If we had an additional stimulus that were to occur here, then yes, we could send another signal. So absolute and relative refractory periods, again, allows what we call 
saltatory conduction to occur in a single direction down the axon. Conductance speed is going to be relying on two physical parameters of our axons and our neurons. First is going to be the diameter of an axon. So the smaller the diameter, the more resistance can be built up. The reason for that is more of our cytoplasm is actually in contact with the cell membrane. And so that means that we can have more stuff kind of leaking out. And if you don't believe this, think about fluid dynamics in a hose, right? If you um, have a smaller hose versus a larger hose, there's going to be more resistance building up because more of that water is going to be touching on the hose itself. Whereas here, you can have water that's passing through that has almost no resistance, right? It's moving through the middle. The next thing is going to be ion leakage. So the easier it is for an ion to leak out of the cell, the slower that's going to be. It's going to slow down the speed. So how do we increase conduction speeds? Well, you increase the diameter, so you get a larger axon, and you minimize that ion leakage resistance that can occur. So if you think about a, a wire like in your wall, the larger the wire, the faster we can send a speed, and like if we're using an internet cable, right, if you get a larger cable, it can go faster, and the more you insulate it. So if we put insulation around our wire, or around our axon in this case, it's going to prevent that ion leakage. What gives insulation in a neuron? That's the myelinization. So if we're in the peripheral nervous system, it's a Schwann cell. If we're in the central nervous system, it's an oligodendrocyte cell. And essentially what that is, is we have a cell this accessory cell and it's as it starts to mature it actually gets rid of its cytoplasm and as it gets rid of its cytoplasm that makes you, you kind of think of a balloon right if you let the air out of the balloon you then just have this shrunken balloon that you can then wrap around and so that's what the cell does it literally wraps that empty balloon around the neuron right so here's my neuron coming out again the 3d picture it wraps it around and that's how it insulates So it can be thin, it can be thick. The thicker it is, the more it insulates, the more it reduces the resistance of ion leaking out of that neuron. And that means we have to have less input in order to maintain that depolarization during our, uh, down our axon. So uh, I think the book describes this as, uh, imagine every time we want to do an action potential um, and you had to re-up it, so like make another domino, you had to type in an A, right, into a keyboard. So you'd have to hit A, 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 action potentials to send it this long. But when we have uh, myelinization, now it's kind of like hitting A, and then you hit tab, and then A, tab, A. You can go the same space, but it takes less input going in. Why? Because during this time, this space, this is where we have our myelin, and it's preventing that depolarization of the membrane to be easily lost. So it's only in these nodes of Ranvier that we have lots of sodium and potassium channels. How can we alter the electrical activity of a nerve cell? Well, um, we can do things like remove out the, the myelinization. If we, if we get rid of that myelinization, um, that's going to alter the electrical activity of the nerve cell. Uh, this is things like multiple sclerosis, uh, in which we have degeneration of the myelin sheath, and that limits the speed at which we can send signals um, down the neuron. It becomes much slower, uh, and this can disrupt electrical signaling, especially in our muscles. Okay, we're going to stop here. This got us through um, sections 8.3. And uh, we please, you know, go through, make sure you look at your, um, your study guide and get those questions answered and turned in this week.